welcome back. And if you weren't here for the last session, welcome uh, to this evening. And welcome to uh, a key uh, session here tonight at the French Institute for the Night of Ideas. My name is Jason Solomons, in case you missed that earlier. I'm a film editor of The New European and a film producer. Uh, and we're in a in an area, I, try, I work in an area where AI is becoming increasingly used to write scripts, to do chat GTP, to make uh, mood boards, to do pitches for films. People are doing it by AI. I, I didn't ask AI to write my, my speech for this opening tonight, but I'm sure that our panel probably fed up with questions about what AI can do and cheap jokes about what AI can do because it's very much here to stay and it's very much part of all of our industries. So to find out a lot more about it, let us unleash artificial intelligence. We have, well, very intelligent people to talk to us, and I, they are real. I've shaken hands with all of them, uh, so I can swear that they are uh, all generated by flesh and blood and muscle, and we're going to hear uh, what their brains have to say. Would you please welcome uh, to the stage the chair, Yves Alexandre de Montjoie. He'll be joined, oh, he's going the long way around. He'll be joined by uh, Lionel Trasenko from the University of Oxford, Rubens College. Sebastian Crier and wearing the jacket of the night, outfit of the night already, she's won the competition, Melanie Garson. There will be a Q&A session at the end as there were at the last, so do uh, store up your questions. Do not use your phones to ask the questions and get AI questions. They're real questions in response to a real debate. Uh, I'll leave you uh, in the hand of Yves Alexandre. Perfect. Um, yeah, I guess this works. Um, so I'm Yves Alexandre Monja. I'm an associate professor at Imperial College uh, in uh, London, and I have the pleasure to chair uh, today's uh, panel on unleashing artificial uh, intelligence, uh, which is basically it's a technical version. It's going to change the way we live, we work, we interact with one another. Can we get the benefits? Can we reap the benefits without some of the risks and the existential risks? Um, to answer this question, I have a distinguished panel uh, today. So starting um, on the right-hand side, we have uh, Lionel uh, Tarasenko, who is the president of Ruben uh, College and the lead for AI and machine learning uh, cluster at Oxford. Um, he's a coordinating expert in signal processing and machine learning for healthcare, the founding director of Oxy Health, an AI uh, company whose products are deployed in 40% of NHS uh, trust. Thank you for joining us today, Lionel. Thank you. Um, in the middle, uh, we do have uh, Melanie Garçon, uh, who's the cyber policy and tech policy lead at the Tony Blair uh, Institute. Um, she's an associate professor in international conflict resolution and international security in the Department of Political Science at UCL, uh, where she teaches about cyber warfare and the future of conflicts in the digital age. And then last but not least, uh, we have Sébastien Crier, uh, who's a policy uh, development and strategy manager at Google DeepMind, uh, where he specializes at the intersection of EI, AI, uh, research and strategy to shape DeepMind's policy on frontier uh, AI governance. And before joining uh, DeepMind, he was a senior technology uh, policy researcher at uh, Stanford and advised various government organizations on AI policy and governance. Um, so basically, we have uh, an hour uh, tonight to discuss AI, which is a big topic. There's lots of things that we want to talk about. Uh, and we don't have much time. So basically what we're going to try to do is we'll start with basically short introductory remarks by each of the panelists, uh, basically both giving their views on the risks, the existential risk in particular, as well as the benefits. One example of how do they see AI benefit us as a society. Then we'll have a moderated conversation uh, with the panel for 15 minutes before opening up uh, the floor to uh, questions from the audience. Without further ado, Lionel, do you want to give us Thank your you remarks? very much. So I'm heavily biased towards the benefits from the risks. I'll tell you that up front. Um, partly because um, I work in healthcare, but also 
because um, I was doing machine learning before it was even called machine learning. Um, and we're using AI tonight, but actually we could use two different letters, ML, machine learning. 90% of what we're going to talk about is probably machine learning. So these algorithms trained on data to do extraordinary things like um, you know, GPT 3.5, which is also known as ChatGPT, or GPT 4.0. But if you read about the risks of AI and so on, there are global um, risks that people think about, but it is important to think as well that it is different according to the sector. So in healthcare, um, risk-benefit analysis has always been there for a very long time. And you'll be surprised, or maybe not, to find that the regulatory agency in the US, the FDA, Food and Drugs Administration, which approves both software, medical devices, uh, new vaccines, and so on, has already approved 700 AI algorithms for use um, around the world. Um, in this country, we're also very good at regulating software as a medical device through the MHRA. The MHRA approved the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, before any other regulatory agency in the world, but it also does devices, also does software. So there's a track re record of approving um, these types of algorithm. As I say, we, we're talking about hundreds of them already having been uh, approved. And I'll give you one example. Um, if I might just give you two examples without uh, taking too much time. There aren't enough radiologists in the world. It's a fact. In, in the developed world, never mind the developing world. So when you have somebody, say a woman's had a mammogram who's at risk of breast cancer, normally, up until fairly recently, it was read by two radiologists. We don't have enough radiologists to read all the mammograms in this country. So one way to do it is radiology one may still be a human being, but radiology two will be a machine learning algorithm. And we know, big study done with 10, 000, tens of thousands of women at the University of Lund in Sweden, that the machine learning radiologist is as accurate as the human radiologist. So in the old days, you have radiology one, radiology two, let's say reading each the same 100 mammograms, and where they disagree, let's say 10 of them, there's a third radiologist that comes in to arbitrate. So that's 210 mammograms read by three radiologists. What happens now, radiology one will still be a human being, radiology two, radiology two will be a machine learning algorithm, and it's exactly the same. One and two are compared, and where they disagree, you bring in a third. But instead of having to read, uh, human beings having to read 210 mammograms, if you do the math, they only read 110 if there's disagreement between one and two again for 10. So you're twice as efficient, and so that's why it's happening now. It's there already, it's happening at the front door scanner when somebody comes in uh, with a suspected stroke. We'd love to have a stroke consultant at the front door of every hospital uh, with 20 years experience. We don't. So we have juniors who read the MRI scans and they have a piece of software by a company called Brainomics. It's spin out from the University of Oxford, been trialed in about 15 NHS trusts. And so what it does, it augments the intelligence of the junior doctor at the front door, because you can't have a consultant 20 years experience at every front door of every hospital where somebody uh, with a suspected stroke is coming in. And what we found through that, and it's all documented, people, it's very important if you have a stroke to have treatment as early as possible. It makes a big difference. The longer you delay, the worse the effects are going to be on the patient. And what we found through using this augmentation of AI for the people who are not so well trained as a consultant with 20 year experience, um, average across the 15 NHS trusts, um, before AI was introduced, 16% of people left with no functional or very minor functional um, deficiencies as a result of having a stroke. That has gone up from 16% to 48% through the use of AI. So I'm sure you'd all want to applaud those users of AI. Thank you very much. Uh, Melanie? It's always hard to beat the health thing. <laughs> 
Uh, I'm also a massive uh, tech optimist, and you know, across it's really hard to pick one area of thinking about where AI contributes, whether that's from the agriculture sector and sort of better weather prediction for be able to sow and reap in farming, whether that's thinking about how you manage disaster resilience, whether it's really simple things, and one that I love uh, most recently, I don't know if anyone's been watching it, is the competition about the texts from Herculaneum, about where they were found these texts. Now, on a personal note, where I did my first degree in modern ancient Semitic languages, and I had a whole exam paper with pictures of the Dead Sea Scrolls and can you fill in the missing word, that <laughs> this would have been really helpful. So where it's going to open up, and it's an area we don't think about, where it adds to our history, our understanding, our, where we look at the past. My worry, or where I feel the risks lie, I mean, we talk a lot, the conversation is very targeted around sort of, if you want the top of the pyramid, where we talk about existential risk, where we talk about how close we're going to get to artificial gen general intelligence, we're going to have killer robots that are going to get us. That's possibly something to worry about, but my concern is this technology is built by a huge group of amazing optimists. They see how to make the world a, a better place. The only people more creative than those optimists are the people that know how to use that technology to derail the optimists. And that my concern is often that the technology, there's a sort of security maturity gap in how we roll out the technology to be able to make it safe and usable and whilst the really creative malicious actors are having a field day on possibly how to derail it. The other area of risk that I have concerns about is, again, we think about there's a whole pyramid of, if you want, physical infrastructure as well as data infrastructure that underpins everything we're trying to do on this very narrow application layer. And that's not evenly distributed globally. And there's potentially where this, all this compute infrastructure comes in, um, it's not accessible and may not be viable for every country to build that. So how do we think about making sure that we're not creating a new digital divide, that these countries that are able to access and actually build their own bespoke versions of this, their country appropriate, their culturally appropriate levels of access to these technologies, and that they reap the benefits on their own levels. So it's like thinking about risk in a slightly different way and whether the geopolitical rivalries that exist all the way through those that stack, whether that's semiconductor chips, whether that um, just access of other components throughout the thing, whether that could, we're in an age of extraordinary multipolarity and instability, and whether we're going to see that geopolitical risk create a non-technological AI winter where we're going to be sort of stymied in what we want to do. So that's my start of a 10. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Sebastian. Very happy to be here. And yeah, I work at Google DeepMind. Uh, we were founded in 2010, and uh, our mission was to solve intelligence to advance science and benefit mankind. Um, easy. And so um, I think I'll just tell you a bit you know, about what we've been thinking about lately and some of our recent thoughts on both the opportunity side and the risks. Um, so I think you know, when, you, when you look at the last few years, there's been some really incredible advances in artificial intelligence and particularly large language models. I'm sure some of you have tried um, ChatGPT or what was then called BARD, but as of today is now called Gemini. And, um, and I think these are really impressive and you know, incredible um, use cases for AI, but uh, to be a bit contrarian for this talk, I'll just talk about some of the other applications that I think sometimes don't get the uh, limelight as much. And so, for example, we've uh, at DeepMind developed a system called AlphaFold, which was um, a model that predicted about 200 million proteins. And so that's about all of the proteins known uh, to mankind. And to give you a sense of scale, it normally takes, you know, from months to years to predict a single protein, you know, in a, in a lab. And so um, this is going to be obviously and is already um, having lots of downstream impact in terms of genomics, vaccine research, and healthcare more generally, and loads of other areas as well. The other example I had in mind was from a few weeks ago, we released alpha geometry, and language models are actually notoriously bad at mathematics and geometry. 
But um, we've developed this, this new model that we kind of also open sourced, which essentially reaches um, gold math Olympiad level at um, solving very complex uh, geometry problems. So again, another uh, interesting use case that will have loads of um, impactful downstream applications. And the third and last one I want to discuss is uh, GraphCast. Again, this was a, a model I think is now the best model in the world at predicting the weather for the next 10 days. And uh, you know, clearly beats the, the state of the art at the time before it was released. And again, if you think about how that can be used, you can think about it in you know, food irrigation, agriculture, climate research, loads and loads of, kind of very, very impactful research areas. So I do think that AI will be a really transformative technology and a very important one in many, many respects, and particularly in science. However, I do also think that um, in, you know, there are many kind of risks that are documented, I think existing risks, people have heard about bias, about you know, toxic language and so on. And we have plenty of people at DeepMind working on this kind of stuff. We've got teams developing evaluations, tools, and systems, and frameworks to kind of better mitigate these harms. And we also have people looking at the risks uh, ahead, and uh, myself included. And we think that, you know, um, because you know, existing risks mean that they are very important, that doesn't mean you don't have to try to think and preempt things a bit in advance sometimes, even though it's very difficult to do so. And we're quite happy that a lot of governments have been paying more attention to this lately. Uh, there was the AI Safety Summit back in November in London. We, had, uh, we will have the next Safety Summit in Korea in May, and the subsequent one after that in France. So we're very much looking forward to this. And I'd like to just conclude with three points uh, on, this, on this respect. So firstly, I think we shouldn't over-index too much on the present either. So it's an area that moves very, very fast. There's lots of research. And I would certainly expect that in the coming years, you'll see models with a lot more um, multimodality, for example, so being able to generate videos. You'll see models with much better tools access, so being able to use a browser or software. You might also see models with much better and deeper reasoning, uh, long-term planning and memory. And all of this makes these models much more useful and much more kind of impactful, but also there's a lot of unknown unknowns and known unknowns that I think we should um, pay a lot of attention to. And that leads me to my second point. The way to do this is, uh, at least one of the ways to do this is evaluations. Um, I think there's a, it's a nascent science, and you can think of that as you know, trying in a lab to find out how capable are these models, what can they really do and not do. And I think we'll have to have many more of these in the coming years with you know, civil society, academia, governments, to better understand what these models are capable of. And then finally, my last point is, uh, we should also not over-index on risk alone. Uh, risk is very important, but risk does not equal harm necessarily. And uh, there are loads and loads of very positive and impactful applications for AI. Um, the reason we're developing these systems ultimately is to try to solve some huge challenges mankind has had in terms of climate, in terms of energy, food scarcity, and more. So I think we should try to remain you know, calibrated and, and, and careful in our judgment of the technologies um, without being either overly optimistic or overly pessimistic. So that was my centrist view on, on AI. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, so maybe to start the discussion, um, so I think when we prepared for this panel, uh, Lionel, you mentioned that you know you are not very worried. I think none of us are about the existential risk, the like you know suddenly something really terrible happening. But you did emphasize the need for regulation and for application-specific regulation to address you know very specific risks. So can you tell us maybe a bit more about this? Yes, I mean I think that different sectors will have different regulation. There will be some underpinning kind of safety nets across all sectors, and then different sectors will, and indeed I think um, the um, European Union has already been thinking about this, and the way that they've been thinking about it horizontally rather than vertically per sector is to try and assess the level of risk from unacceptable to low risk. And they were doing that in 2021. And of course, what happened is ChatGPT happened in 2022, late 2022. And that sort of threw a huge spanner in the works. Um, and they're trying to think about ChatGPT's large language model, subset of foundation models. They're trying to think about these foundation models and how you regulate them. Um, and that's much harder because it is difficult to predict um, how they're going to be used. And we talked about malicious actors. Again, as a technologist, I'm probably confident deep fakes and so on. Um, at companies like Google DeepMind, people are working on all sorts of techniques like smart watermarking. And we don't have to go through the details, but um, 
it means that images generated by a large language model, or a large vision model sometimes called, um, would be identified um, through some form of watermarking. And I think the same thing can happen if people try to use these models for malicious users, for example, uh, designing weapons and so on. Now, there's a lot of work going on at places where we don't have access to, places like GCHQ and so on, but I have no doubt there are some great brains thinking about how we protect ourselves from the use of these technologies by uh, malicious actors. Um, it sort of is always two sides of a coin. Melanie was saying she was worried about people, say, in the developing world who have less access maybe to this, but all of these are pretty much open source. They are the P in GPT is pre-trained. They're pre-trained, and you do need to be one of the big tech companies. You know, one of them represented here. There are five others um, to have the resources to train these models. But then, what you can do is to fine-tune them. Um, you can fine-tune them for your application, or you can take the architecture of a large language model, like a transform and so on, and train it on a subset of data. One of the things we do in healthcare is take 10 years' worth of patient data, all the textbooks on oncology, for example, if you're trying to predict whether somebody's going to have cancer or not, and that's a much smaller subset of data. It's not the whole of the internet, and you can train that with about 200 lines of code. You know, I have a final year undergraduate doing that type of project. Um, there's a lot of open source code, so that makes it accessible to, I think, countries where there are less or fewer resources. However, it also makes it um, accessible to malicious actors. And that's where we need to think about how we can prevent these technologies which are accessible to a lot of people falling into the wrong hands. And the final thing I would say is perhaps something to think about. We don't fully understand how they work. I'll give you an example. Most people here speak French, I would imagine. So in French we say, le cahier ou le livre que j'ai ouvert, mais la porte que j'ai ouverte. So, ChatGPT, GPT-3, or GPT-3.5, doesn't get that right. Randomly, it adds an E or not if it's feminine. GPT-4.0 gets that right. And it's the same learning algorithm. It's just a much bigger network with about 13 trillion weights in it, and trained for longer, and um, bigger data sets, and its emergent properties is called, is to get this right, whereas GPT 3.5, chat GPT doesn't. And we don't fully understand why that is. And as a technologist, I worry about the things I don't understand. So the ability to explain why GPT 3.5 and GPT 4.0 get different answers. Another test, by the way, is the American Bar Association exam to become a, a qualified lawyer in the US. GPT 3.0, 3.5 fails the American Bar exam. GPT 4.0 passes it with flying colors. Same algorithms, same transformer architecture and so on. We don't understand why that is. And that's an area where I think we need to put more effort to understand exactly or better how these large language models work, um, because um, if you don't understand fully how they work, that introduces an element of risk. Thanks a lot. Um, so maybe Sebastian, I think you're you know you've been doing policy for uh, DeepMind for um, for quite a while. So I'm sure you've thought about this quite a lot, which is you know you have very horizontal regulation like DA Act, you have sector-specific regulation, application-specific regulation, healthcare, aviation, et cetera, et cetera. And then you basically have self-regulation by companies. Could you tell us a bit more about how you see the three of them you know, coming together and addressing different risks? Yeah, I'll try. Um, I think, so broadly, you know, we've always thought at, you know, at Google DeepMind that uh, AI was too important not to regulate well as a starting principle. And so I think we've been, um, you know, observing you know, these developments over the last few years quite closely. And, um, and I believe that the AI Act is now kind of being finalized. And, you know, we're, as I said, this, we do accept and, and, you know, in fact, encourage a risk-based approach, which is what I think the AI Act does take. So looking at, you know, what is high risk, what is lower risk, and having a proportionate view there to try to kind of balance what might be the more um, 
concerning aspects of the technology versus the less concerning ones. But there's also different models, and it'll be interesting to see how this pans out. Um, in the UK, they're kind of taking a more um, sectoral approach. And in some respects, I think there will be certain things that might make sense at a kind of horizontal level. But uh, in many instances also, I think you know, a regulator in healthcare or a regulator in finance will have far more understanding of the models or the kind of systems that get used in their verticals and the kinds of mitigations, the kinds of interventions that might be legitimate or required or proportionate in that particular ver vertical. But it's definitely not a clear cut you know, um, answer, I think. And I think um, certainly self-regulation might not be sufficient. That's, that's perhaps um, something we can all agree on. And I think more importantly at, this, at the moment, um, you know, it'll take some time to see which approach um, bears more fruit. But I would suspect that the thing we should try to incentivize at this moment is more interoperability between these different systems, um, or rather the different kind of regulatory systems, I mean. Uh, you'd want kind of some mutual recognition, some standardization. Uh, you'd want kind of more discussions, you know, between the EU, the UK, the US, to ensure that ultimately, you know, if you comply with, I guess, one set of rules, you broadly know that you're compliant with the other ones as well. So I think that is certainly the kind of thing that will make, um, you know, enhance both the safety aspect and the trade and kind of innovation side. Thanks a lot. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, actually, it was signed yesterday uh, into, into... Yeah, the they, they, they signed many things, but, but yeah. I th possibly yesterday, um, yes. I think they, yeah. And so basically, just so the Air Act is the, the large horizontal regulation uh, that was just passed by the uh, European Union. Um, but one thing that's interestingly is completely outside of the scope of the AI Act is actually the use of AI for defense, the use of AI in war. Um, which I think is exactly your topic, Melanie. So how do we, how do we regulate AI when it comes to, you know, such dramatic situation as war? Yeah, I mean, it may have been out of the AI Act. It's certainly not been out of people's minds. And uh, I mean, certainly with conversations I've been involved in, going back to like 2015, 2016, have been you know, a long time trying to unravel this. And what people less, you know, certainly in Europe, people thought about the AI Act, what people don't uh, look at as much as there was actually a big conference in The Hague in February last year called Reaim. It was about uh, particularly uh, regulating AI in the military. A very broad base of countries came together, including China, which is sort of, you know, the big conversation prior to the AI safety summit is whether China would be at the table. But there was a broad spectrum of 60 countries that actually came together and sort of set together a code of conduct or so the compact on what they're watching for in AI in the military and in the defense so it's not going without concern or regulation and sort of normative approaches and there's already regulation in and this is you know the big question that we have across technology is whether we need new law whether the law we have is resilient enough to deal with it should we graft on it at all so whether principles of international humanitarian law or laws of war operate it doesn't matter what the technology you're using to do it they still apply to where we get the means and the method and how we uh, close them Granted, and the, you know, as I say, the big questions that often exist is the, the highly existential ones and the philosophical ones. Do you have the right to be killed by a human or, you know, in the battlefield? What does, how much do we keep the human on the loop in these questions? Like, where does the final decision making rest? And that's very different with offensive capability. There's widespread use of. Um, AI enabled processes in defensive capability globally it's people worry about the other side of that picture but there's also and I you know on a personal note I believe maybe wrongly that author, you know, people still about oh, are they going to put nuclear weapons totally in the hands of an autonomous process so like without a human on the loop the nature of the countries we worry about the nature of authoritarianism is control so fundamentally, are you going to put your most powerful thing you control as where philosophically you control everything outside of your control? I'm not entirely sure that that's uh, there. But there's also other elements where it will improve defense, where we think about building AI-enabled process into the procurement process, into being able to manage supply chains, into sometimes there's the question of just making the process possibly 
less violent, more precision oriented. Again, another question about whether that lowers the cost of water, we'll fight more wars, we don't know. But there are, so there's uh, always a honey in the sting with every one of these questions, but definitely being thought about. I can't say there's definitely concrete answers yet. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> So maybe to come back to a point that you made earlier, um, Sebastian, I think there's there's basically a raging debate in you know the technical and the policy communities on open source. This idea that um, you know we are going to take the logic of open source for AI models and we're just going to publish them on the internet and anyone can take them and improve them and use them and make them safer. And I think. On the one hand, some people are like, well, this is losing control. This is very dangerous. It's such a dangerous thing. We should have a handful of companies that are authorized to develop these models and, you know, and, and control them the way we control weapons. And others are saying, well, no, like AI is the best AI, the safest AI is actually going to be the open one. Right? When you look at cryptography, for example, the best crypto libraries are the open source one, the one that everyone can go and verify. Um, where do you think? Where, do, where should we, what, what's your perspective? Where should we go, Sebastian? So I think that the um, you know, existing models you see um, being published in you know, open source online uh, aren't particularly concerning to me. So I think when you look at Llama 2, for example, or, or Mistral 7B and so on, like, they're actually very useful. A lot of people can you know, conduct lots of research on them. You can have better kind of um, mechanistic interpretability research on this kind of stuff. So overall, um, not something that I find particularly concerning. But I think that uh, what I find a bit um, disappointing is the, the general, um, somewhat ideological approach to, uh, you know, open is always safer, closed is always necessarily safer. And I think you can definitely take a case by case approach for this. And I think for frontier models, these like enormous, enormous models that, you know, we just, you know, are still understanding and finding out new things about them, new capabilities. Um, I think it makes sense to wait and to, you know, to, to a degree, analyze and kind of try to understand them a little bit better before fully open sourcing something. Because once you do open source something, you can't exactly uh, undo that thing. It's irreversibly done. But as a general starting point, I'd say that I'm not particularly worried about what is um, you know, open source at the moment. But I think over time, uh, as you have models with more and more capabilities, depending on what they do, I think you can make uh, a reasonable you know, cost-benefit assessment eventually to just understand you know, there's many also like different ways of, of releasing and opening a model. You can have APIs, you can have structured access, you can have many different ways of, of allowing um, models to be used, researched on and tested. So uh, in the future, I think, you know, it'll just be a good muscle to have to kind of really evaluate and understand the models before making a decision as to the access modality. Um, but I think, um, yeah, for the, for the moment, I think this is where I stand. Um, but even, you know, at the moment, you know, Meta has, a, has an, uh, an AI model called Voicebox. And, um, and Voicebox allows voice cloning technology, and it's not open source. And I, I would suspect that you know, if you open source this particular model, uh, I suspect that the misuses will probably outweigh the positive uses of voice cloning. And so I think you can just do this on a case-by-case -case basis. So you know, you have this large model, yet it does these particular things. Does it add to the marginal risk? You know, if it is open relative to the counterfactual of what can already be done. And then you, know, and then you can start talking and discussing these things on a more, um, I think, principled level than open is always necessarily better forever and always safer versus you know, closed being always safer either. Thank you. Um, so maybe before we open the floor to uh, questions, uh, you mentioned nuclear, right? And nuclear is actually you know, an analogy that is used quite a lot to discuss proliferation of AI and potential risks and this question of control. Uh, what do you both think? Is the nuclear analogy uh, a good one, a useful one to think about you know, the risk benefit of AI or is that just something we need to give up on? I think it's helpful, it doesn't solve the whole problem. Uh, I speak as one whose father worked for the CEA in France, Commissariat à l'énergie atomique, and then came to work in this country, um, which is the reason why I ended up in this country, having been born in France. Um, so, I know a little bit about the nuclear industry. What I would take away from the nuclear industry is the fact that they have transparency. And that's really, really important. So, in some ways, open source is part of the transparency, but it's a lot more than that. I'll give you one example, because we must throw it to the open to the audience quite quickly, so it'll be quite quick. Um, some of these autonomous taxis in San Francisco were withdrawn recently. And I think what would have been really helpful if there'd been a kind of nuclear industry type watchdog for AI, 
people talk about the International Atomic Energy Agency, the IAEA for AI, lots of I's and A's, um, then they would have wanted to look at what we call the edge cases. Where did it become dangerous for these autonomous taxis? Was it because somebody crossed the road in an unexpected place at an unusual angle to traffic? Was it a bicycle, one of these Californian cyclists weaving themselves in and out of traffic? Was it the rain? I mean, we know the sensors don't work as well when, it's, when it rains. Uh, I'd love to know. And I think that information should be shared. And that's what happens in the nuclear industry. The information is shared. And so that's one thing we could really learn from the nuclear industry is um, to, to bring companies that have applications like autonomous vehicles and so on and say, look, this isn't about trying to affect the share price of your company. It's about bringing those edge cases in a way that doesn't destroy your intellectual property, but allows everyone to learn from them what are the dangerous situations when you use this AI type software in these autonomous vehicles. I'm a little bit, so I'm more skeptical about the nuclear analogy. Whilst I accept the sort of need to have that overarching regulator and sort of having that you know central body a we already know from the nuclear industry how difficult that is to even we talk about the transparency but certainly with rogue nations or nations that don't provide that and also but on the counter side of that you can see what's going on with nuclear energy from space you can actually see what's going on here we're talking about processes that aren't as visible to some extent they on the massive like macro level, you will see the energy usage of where it is, but it's not the same way you can measure and spot radiation a mile away and know, you know, have a good flag to what you're doing. So I think too much reliance on the analogy can actually derail us from the thinking about, and, and I think it's a bigger picture of what we have to think about as a global community, as industry and civil society and government together, sort of what does good look like for, the future, what is that picture of good, of where we know that we have trustworthy, tested, safe products that are, you know, when we've done the consumer protection angle, which is where some of the uh, EU position comes from, like, you know, fit for purpose, safe for use, like a hairdryer, not gonna explode when you use it. And then how do we then create the mechanism to get there, rather than being too comparative with other bodies for that my little bit of counter take sounds good fantastic um thanks everyone so we're gonna open the floor to question uh let's please keep the question short and if it starts with it's more for comment of a question please don't ask it so real questions short please uh thank you very much um very very interesting uh conversation uh, I think for me, y you place a lot of emphasis um, in this discussion around how artificial intelligence can kind of enable what we currently do, right? It helps us effectively scale our abilities. Um, the oncology example, the 200,000 proteins, for example. But I guess the question is, how far away are we from having artificial intelligence create something that is truly original? And what will be the impact of that when it does happen? <laughs> um, I can't tell you exactly how far we are <laughs> from that moment, but I think there is something around, you know, how exactly you even define, you know, new knowledge and whether, you know, new knowledge is just a recombination of other existing concepts and principles and, you know, an emergent property in a sense, or, or if it is actually something completely separate. Um, so I think conceptually it's already a difficult one to really um, to answer. Um, we had this, this fund search model as well that was published not long ago, at least a paper about it, which I think did find new proofs for mathematical kind of theories, but ultimately I think, you know, my expectation is that over time, uh, as the models continue, you know, and my kind of assumption is that I do think we're not kind of hitting some sort of upper bound at the moment. So I would suspect that as capabilities continue getting better and you're using these systems for more, um, you know, for research, for R&D, you will eventually also get these models being used to produce new knowledge and new research. But um, I think it's yeah hard to really define probably the parameters of how you 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 know you def evaluate what is new knowledge. But I think you know a, la a large language model alone, I think in its current state, I suppose of just Q and A type thing, uh, would not you know necessarily produce new knowledge in a sense that like you know new discovery kind of thing. 
But I think um, you know, large language models will be one part of the larger equation of different systems working together with reinforcement learning and loads of others. And I think at that stage, when you get to this more mature kind of ecosystem, I would expect to see a lot more kind of novel discoveries and novel kind of knowledge created by them. Um, how soon, I'm not sure, but um, I'm on the optimistic, pessimistic, depends how you see it, but uh, fairly, fairly soon side, I think. Thank you. Um, yep. Yes, hello, I've been enjoying the discussion. Uh, my concerns are about um, uh, the ethical side of things. So when you say that it's being regulated, how is it being regulated? Why do we not have as much of a say um, in what's going on in AI? And I, for an example I give, I'm being treated for cancer, and it's a very rare type of cancer which was not even picked up on scans. So if you're saying that, you know, within the radiology and all of the tests that they're reading my test, mine was only picked up by somebody who was very experienced. The other is, for example, with our mayor who's trying to force ULEs and LTNs, will AI be used as a surveillance tool? And again, how, what, what say do we have, and how will that be regulated so that it doesn't have control over us? I actually think that it's nothing more than a plagiarism of us. That's what I believe AI is. So, me, yeah. so I think there's two parts to that question. I'll do the first. Who wants to I'll think about this? You'll do the second, <laughs> Melanie. Okay. The first one. So just to be absolutely clear, the stroke example is happening now. The radiologist is still not happening. It's not reg regulated. But that's where we're going simply because there aren't enough human beings to, to read. And the idea is actually, it's fantastic you had a very experienced uh, clinician available, but I thought the stroke example tried to deal with that, that ideally you'd have a stroke consultant at the front door of every hospital that is just not, fi with 20 years experience of looking at the MRI scans of people who come in either with uh, hemorrhagic stroke where it's a bleed or uh, ischemic stroke where there's an obstruction. It's very important you know the difference because the outcome is completely different if you misidentify and, and give the wrong treatment. Um, so the idea is for all of those applications to augment the intelligence, not to take over, So, uh, which means that if we got it right, the problem with what uh, you're saying is if it's very rare, then we may not have trained an AI with enough data to be able to recognize a rare case. But the idea would be that people with general amount of training, their intelligence will be augmented to be able to see something that they might not have seen at all in their training, but the AI would, and therefore their intelligence would be augmented. So that's the ideal, that's what we're aiming for, um, and that's what we should go for. It's augmented, I prefer AI to be augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence. But the second half of the question is for Melanie. No, and you're absolutely right. Many of the questions that we have regarding the fundamental ethics, and that goes to some of this training data, so globally sort of where the bias is still existing within the data that's being trained, and there are ways that that's attempting to be resolved both with synthetic data, but there's also a, and this is a problem, you know, and this is why I talk about, again, what's going on under the stack, and data is a big part of that picture of the accessibility and countries globally that have a data sovereignty position because of very tight hold because they're worried about their data being exploited and not reaping the benefits of it and therefore we don't get the global picture sometimes it would pick up more of these rare conditions and then absolutely right the question i mean only over the last two days funnily enough um over actually it's been a french uk initiative over fcdo they've been looking at surveillance technologies and particularly sort of regulating use and commitments to using where surveillance so there is a lot of tension as and this goes through the problem of digitalization and where tracking and gps and particularly concerns for women and women in abusive relationships and where we have to think about how we mitigate the controls because, you know, for every, I would say for every capability, there's great vulnerability. And that's uh, really thinking about how we are aware and, and they're not easy questions. And that's why finding the ways of not blanketing out 
everything all at once and having the, each one of these needs to be dealt in a nuanced way so that we don't disadvantage ourselves in finding solutions that we need to. So that's the challenge in it. Thank you. I think we have two more questions. Hi, thanks for such a stimulating panel. Um, I'm also a tech optimist, but I'm also a lawyer. So my question is about regulation. Um, I'm at Cloisters Chambers and two of my colleagues are working with the government on an AI and discrimination bill, or employment bill rather, to safeguard against the equality and the discrimination implications of AI in the employment context. As tech optimists, um, do you think it's actually possible to effectively regulate um, the um, sort of discriminatory decision making that, that may occur when often even developers can't look into the black box and actually work out why something um, has happened in the way that it has. I can try, but um, I think so. I'm also a lawyer, so I, I, I appreciate the. Uh, <laughs> It's not an easy one. I think, but basically, I mean, yes, I think uh, you may not necessarily need to have um, full scrutability of the you know, black box of, of, you know, of a model to necessarily legislate on the outcomes. So I think if you look at what happens, you know, you just look at what the, the model kind of recommends and what people do relying on them and so on, and you can very well decide that actually, you know, this model shows a statistical bias that is kind of unacceptable or, you know, unjustified and, and simply kind of, you know, in a way, prohibit or regulate that. So I think in that particular context, again, I, I'm not a, an either an employment lawyer or, or developing tools for employment context, but I would imagine that there are ways to, you know, recalibrate um, algorithms actually. You have, there's actually a lot of literature on different conceptions of fairness, and they're all mathematically incompatible. So trying to find the right one is a normative choice, and I think that's one where regulators, governments can actually opine on saying, well, in the context of you know uh, a healthcare kind of decision make, making a system, or in the context of an employment one, this is what we deem you know acceptable, and this is what we deem unacceptable. And then, and then after that, I think you don't need access actually to the black box model to determine what is allowed or not allowed to be used. So, um, so in that sense, yeah, I think it's it's certainly possible. And um, and yeah, and I think the the difficult question also becomes when. Uh, you know, these models improve over time quite a lot, right? Like a year ago, um, people were saying, oh, they can't do fingers right, and a year before that, you know, they can't do a sentence right. Um, and so I think that the, this potentially would be a point where what if the model is less discriminatory in some sense at some point? What if you're able to fine tune the model and direct it to actually be uh, more effective at, you know, mitigating these biases? And I think there's new questions that kind of arise in that context that I think uh, are sometimes underexplored. Um, there's you know, a lot of literature in the last five years on judicial systems using AI, and I think I've seen one study now, like a few um, months ago, I think, claiming that compared to a, a human sample, the system was actually being less biased in its decision making. Now, again, depends on how exactly you define that, it depends on the variables and metrics you look at, but um, yeah, it's a complex question to unpack, but I think looking at outcomes definitely is a good starting point. Can I jump in on that as well, <laughs> very quickly? I, I think there's a, the two things. One, there was a model in Estonia where they were using um, sort of an AI-enabled tool to help on uh, unemployment in job centres and matching people with jobs, and it had a massive success rate, far better than sort of humans trying to do this matching. So I think it comes down to this thing. It, we can do something, and reminding ourselves, it's a tool. It's a tool we decide when to use and in what context. And just because it can doesn't mean we have to or we should, just in the same way that a child can walk down the street, but do we let it unsupervised? It's, so it's, I think sometimes we have to sort of step back and remind ourselves that just because we can doesn't mean we should. Thanks. Uh, I think we'll take the last question and then we'll give a very short answer and close the panel. Uh, I think the question was at the back. Thank you. Um, um, th thank you for your talk. Um, something I wanted uh, to ask you about, because I feel like we didn't really touch this much tonight. Uh, it's like my, one of my greatest concerns is that this uh, AI revolution is led by big companies that are becoming very influential, like um, even in the political scene. And one of the things that people have been talking about is breaking up these companies in smaller companies. But also most of the research that is now being done in addressing the problems of AI is also done by the same companies. So I'm wondering what's your opinion like how would, like, 
something like breaking up companies would influence the research that is actually going into uh, addressing the problems of AI. Thank you. So I'll, I'll go first. Um, you might have noticed by now that I'm a half full, run, half empty kind of guy. Um, so yes, there are things that can only be done by the big tech companies, which is training on the whole of the internet plus, and I think GPT 4.0, the estimate is $100 million it costs to train. So no university can do that. We, what we're thinking about are the resources, and we can do that at the country level, um, thinking about supercomputers in Cambridge and Bristol here, which would be available to the whole of the academic community. So you're right, we can't compete on absolutely everything, but because these models train by Meta, by Google, by OpenAI and so on, are open source, we can use them. I was at a conference last week where the care sector in this country was getting together to think, how can people who care for their elderly relatives at home, and a lot of people in this country do this, could have maybe chat GPT on their phone and ask a question, oh, my elderly father has just fallen down, is in that position, what should I do next? And you can do that through using chat GPT, but you need to fine tune it to your own data set. So, as I said, there, you can take something generic, and I emphasize again, the P is pre-trained, and train it further, fine tune for your application. Um, and it was amazing, it was the voluntary care sector coming together to think about how they could do this for people who care for their elderly relatives in their homes. So, they, of course, that sector would never be able to train from scratch, but they can use the models that exist and fine tune them. That is possible, that is relatively easy to do for their particular application. So, I, I think there are certain things that can't be done, but there are certain things that can be done. And again, uh, in my own group, we, we train models from scratch, much smaller models, because we want to be able to take uh, the full blood count of a patient in the hospital and try and predict two, three, four years ahead of time whether they might have colorectal cancer, for example. We don't need the whole of the internet to, to, to do that. We can do it, we've got GPUs, we've got a GPU cluster that's usable with, I'm sure, Imperial, I'm sure, UCL, King's, all the universities in London, Oxford, Cambridge, Bristol, other universities are available, have got those resources, it's a smaller problem. So we have to think about what we're trying to do. There are things we can do when we don't need the resources of the big tech companies. We just need to think what is the problem we're trying to solve. And the final point I would make, because of the open source, because ChatGPT is available on your phone if you want and so on, the key thing is not so much the algorithms anymore, it's actually the data. The data is becoming more important than the algorithms themselves. And um, data could be collected by all, all sorts of people. It could be the care sector collect their own data and so on. And it would have a database proprietary to that sector that would be hugely valuable. So it's not just the algorithms, it's the data itself that's becoming more important than these open source algorithms. Sounds good. Uh, and I think on this, uh, we're already slightly late. Uh, so I think we will uh, close the panel. So Lionel, Melanie, Sebastien, thanks a lot for the fantastic conversation. Thank you. Thank you.